Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alex Virtual Pre-Conference Library Preservation Today. This is a three-part virtual pre-conference being held this week, with the next session held on Wednesday at the same time. I'm Stephanie Lampson, and I'll be your host for this presentation. Today's session is Environmental Monitoring and Control, and our presenter today is Julie Mosbo. Julie is the William and Susan Oren Preservation Librarian at Texas A&M University, a position she has held since October 2013. Julie's responsibilities include developing a conservation lab for general circulating collections and special collections, supervising the Digital Service Center, managing the binding unit, supervising staff and student workers, managing the preservation budget, leading emergency response and recovery, monitoring the environment for all library storage facilities, and providing reference in preservation services for the library, university, and the wider community. Julie holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Printmaking and Drawing from the University of Central Arkansas, a Master's in Library and Information Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a Certificate of Advanced Study in Preservation Administration from the University of Texas at Austin. Prior to her position at Texas A&M University, she was the Preservation Librarian at Southern Illinois University Carbondale from 2008 to 2013. Julie has served as chair of the ALA Preservation and Reformatting Section Book and Paper Interest Group and chair of the ALA Preservation Week Committee. She currently serves as chair of the Kuhn Huss Schwartzberg Award Committee and the PARS New Members Working Group. She is also one of the instructors for the ELEX Fundamentals of Preservation online course. So before we start today, there are a few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag that you see on your screen. It is the official Twitter hashtag for Alex events at the ALA Annual Conference in Las Vegas. Feel free to use the hashtag to communicate with each other during the presentation, but please use the question box to communicate with us. We will not be monitoring Twitter during the presentation, and today's webinar does not support interactive chat. If you have questions for us, please type them into the question box on your screen. We have set aside time at the end of our presentation for questions. Any questions we can't get to during the presentation will be answered afterward and the, award, and the answer is sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. Finally, we hope you will take time to fill out the evaluation form that will be sent to you after the session since it will be used by the committee to plan future events. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Julie. There may be a slight delay. Hello all, this is Julie. I just wanted to kind of start off by um, introducing my topic. It's on environmental monitoring and control. Something just happened there. Can you all still see my screen? I'm sorry, something weird happened to me here. All right, okay, now we're gonna go back. So my presentation is on environmental monitoring and control. Before I go to dive into that too much, as Stephanie just introduced me, it was very nice for her to do so, I wanted to go over a little bit more of what I do. And that's a picture of me so that you can have a face to the voice. Uh, I am the William and Susan Oren Preservation Librarian at Texas A&M Universities. I've been here since October 2013. Prior to that, I was a Preservation Librarian at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And I also have been a Fundamentals of Preservation instructor since 2011, have done several of the sessions uh, throughout the company throughout the past years. So to give an overview of what I'm going to be discussing today, I just wanted to kind of give an overview. I'm going to be discussing environmental monitoring control in very broad terms, but I'm going to kind of focus on four different topics, specific topics. I want to look at temperature and humidity. We're going to look at storage and exhibit, pests and mold. And all of these really are combined within that idea of environmental monitoring and control. And within each of these sections, I'm going to discuss what the potential problems are, why it is that we're worried about these items, how we can actually move forward and do preventative care. If we actually kind of plan for these issues and recognize the problems beforehand, we can actually save a lot of time and a lot of money. And that really helps with some of the costs uh, further down the line. So we'll be discussing all of that. So moving on, 
the very first thing that I'm going to talk about is temperature and humidity. And I want you to remember this picture that I have on the screen. I know it looks like a lot of silver, a lot of metal, but what that is is actual HVAC or HVAC ductwork. And as you can see on the lower part of that picture, there is some shelving above that. I'm going to give a case study that has to do with this picture a little later on in this subtopic. But to move forward, again, I wanted to kind of give you an idea of why is it that we are always so worried about temperature and humidity? Why is it so important? So the issues within temperature and humidity, that really contributes to a lot of the problems that we, we find. Uh, it can change the physical makeup of materials. And examples of that include heat. So if you've got too much heat in your temperature, you've got that can help accelerate deterioration, which is something we don't want to see. The high relative humidity can also create problems because it introduces a lot of moisture, which can then do a lot of chemical reactions within the materials that also causes damage. And then always when you've got that high humidity, low temperature issue, that creates an environment for mold growth and also insect activity. And we're going to talk about insects and mold in a little bit. Another issue that we deal with when we're dealing with temperature and humidity is that dramatic fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity causes problems as well. Materials are constantly adapting to their environment, so they're always absorbing and releasing moisture, and that creates that expanding and contraction. Usually when I'm talking to someone in person, I end up interweaving my fingers together very tightly. If you add moisture, you tighten your fingers. When you release the moisture, you loosen your fingers. If you're doing that, you can kind of feel what's happening to your fingers over time. And that, that basically shows you what's going to happen with the fibers. You're contracting, you're contracting and expanding. And when you continuously do that, that weakens the fibers over time and can create a lot of other problems. So we don't really want that. It can lead to issues including the cockling of paper, flanking of ink, warping of the covers or books. Most of you have probably seen when you've got wet books and the, and the cover expands quite a bit and also cracked emulsion, especially when you're dealing with photographs or you're dealing with films. The images that I have on screen here are two examples that I have run across. The first one is of a wall map that was housed in the basement. Uh, it had always been housed in the basement, but then we went through renovation, which took about five years, and we had multiple water disasters over time and lots of moisture coming in. And what happened to this item was as moisture was being introduced, the item became more and more brittle and actually started separating from that backing that you see there, that white part. So we had all sorts of losses, and this map was pretty much unusable and unsavable because we had lost so much of the information there. The image on the bottom example of a lot of archives libraries have AV material as well, and this is of an acetate film. We received that through a gifts donation um, prior to us actually assessing the collection. It was accepted, which always happens, and you just deal with it. But this was an acetate film that had been housed in a really hot environment, and over time the acetate just started decaying. And it's to the extent in this picture that it's basically what we call a puck. And it's solidified. I can't unspool that. It's never going to be usable. And we've basically just lost the item. But if we had housed that in better conditions, we actually would, would have been able to save that and would have been able to use that. So when you're dealing with temperature and humidity, I think most institutions are looking for that end-all, be-all number for your temperature, for what to set your temperature and your humidity standards for. And standards are always good to look at, but you really need to look at what's going on within your own institution, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to show you a couple different standards, because sometimes you'll see information where it gives you a couple different temperatures that might be good, or a couple different humidity, or a range of humidity that you might aim for. And I wanted to show you where a lot of that's coming from, a lot of that, that is coming from literature. Some of it's coming from the National Information Standards Organization, or NISO report, uh, on environmental guidelines for storage of paper materials. So what they have suggested is the combined stack and user areas where the temperature should be about 70 degrees Fahrenheit with a relative humidity of 30 to 50%. That's pretty 
broad span for humidity, but it's, it's pretty standard. For optimum preservation stacks, so this is for preservation, not necessarily the area where you're going to have patrons or you're going to have your staff working, but for optimal preservation stacks, they are saying temperature should be about 35 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit with a relative humidity of 30 to 50 percent. And then that maximum daily fluctuation is temperature is a plus minus two degrees Fahrenheit and for relative humidity is a plus minus three percent. So kind of keep that in mind. The next ones that you see there, the next standard that was published, the Conservation Environment Guidelines for Libraries and Archives in 1990, they state that the ideal environment for library archives for temperature is 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit with an RH of 40 percent to 45. So if you compare it to what we have from NISO, you can see that it's actually within those guidelines. So you can kind of see a pattern that there is, there's a pretty good range of where the temperatures are. The National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA, in 2002, in their ideal environment library and archive, uh, this was a directorate that they put out, they stated that the temperature, ideal temperature would be about 65 degrees Fahrenheit with an RH of 35% to 45%. Now one reason why you might see a little bit of a difference between especially that optimum preservation stacks temperature of 35 to 65 degrees and the others is that that's really based on what kind of materials you have in your collection. There are some items that are going to want it much cooler. Film, negatives, photographs, audio, all of those prefer slightly cooler temperatures and need those temperatures to for preservation. Books, paper, they can handle temperatures that are a little bit warmer, so that's when you get into the 60, 65 degree Fahrenheit. And you can see that actually the relative humidity is actually pretty standard within that 45 degree, 45 percent. So in terms of preventative preservation, what can we do with our collections to prevent them from having those problems we saw before, the cockling, the loss of data, the loss of information, the loss of, of, I mean, uh, of emulsion? What can we do to prevent all that? Well, one of the best ways is creating an environmental monitoring program. And I mean program, not just putting up monitors and walking by them day to day, but actually developing a program, developing a way of monitoring what's going on, reporting, recording, and working with your facilities department. One of the first things that I recommend doing is identifying the types of items in your collections. As I mentioned before, some of materials like things a little bit cooler than others, so you need to identify if you have more photographs in your collection than paper. You might want to change your standards, what you want to set your HVAC system to be, or what you might be asking for a new HVAC system to reach. If you've got primarily paper and book, you've got a little bit more flexibility there. Another thing that I always recommend is work with your facilities personnel to determine what your HVAC system can actually do. Do not, and this is a lesson learned and, and a lesson that I try to repeat as much as I can, do not make your HVAC system do something it wasn't designed to do. Remember that picture I had you look at at the very beginning of my slide presentation I told you that I've got a case study for that. That was, an, that was an issue that I ran across when I had started my job at SIU. I had come in um, during a renovation period all of the design had been made before I got there, as well as all of the, all of the um, direction in terms of the HVAC system. So all of that had already been selected. When I started, they said, we have a brand new HVAC system. What would you like the settings to be? I said, can it handle what I want it to do? And they said, yes, we will make it handle whatever you want it to, to set at. So I asked for 65 degrees Fahrenheit with a RH of 45%. And it was fine for the very first day. And then almost immediately we noticed that we had some problems. What happened was is that it couldn't handle that, and we had condensation within those vents that you saw over the stacks, and you could hear it sloshing around when you, when you kind of shake the, 
the vents, which I don't recommend you shake the vents either, but um, we were trying to figure out what was going on. And we saw that that was a problem. We stopped it, so the HVA system, we, we rose the temperature. Humidity wasn't too much of an issue, but we did raise the temperature, hoping that that would dry out some of the vents, but it didn't. In fact, they started dripping onto our rare books uh, along a certain area. And so that was pretty much a lesson learned, is that we tried to force our HVAC system to do something that it did not want to do. So always look at the specifications on your system. If you have a manual, that's great. Find someone, if you don't, find someone who can tell you what, what the machine can do, what the HV system can do, because that can be detrimental and can do a lot of damage. Another thing that you can do is the use of data loggers or hydrothermographs. There are a variety of different kinds of data loggers out there. At the very top picture you see, that's a little less expensive data loggers. You can get temperature, you can get thermometers and humidity readers from your local hardware store, your local electronics store that aren't that expensive, that could be up to 15 bucks, which in our world isn't that expensive. That top one is a little less expensive. It gives you basic information. It'll give you temperature and it'll give you humidity readouts. The second one you see there is a PEM2 from the Image Permanence Institute. That's another type of data logger. It's a bit more expensive. It provides a little bit more information. You do have to download the data onto a USB drive and then plug it into a computer. And then there's software that you can use. And it can generate graphs and give you all that information. And those could be helpful. And then there's always the good old-fashioned hygrothermographs, which provide a lot of data as well. They are kind of old-fashioned. Some people don't like using them. My, what I have usually noticed is that people don't seem to enjoy uh, switching out the paper, and so I will see months and months on the same piece of paper, which doesn't give me a whole lot of data because I can't tell what month was the problem. But the hygrothermographs are really easy to use, and you can walk through the stacks, you can see what's going on, it's, it's very visible, unlike some of the data loggers where you have to download the material. With, with all the data that you're collecting, it's important to actually record it. So if you've got a basic temperature relative humidity gauge, set down a certain time when you go into the stacks or you, or you monitor the collection, have a slip of, peep, uh, a slip of paper there and record what is actually going on. That way you can go back and see, what, you know, if you notice that over a period of two days that the temperature is going up or the humidity is going down, you can, that's one way of monitoring it. Don't try to use your brain because a lot of times the brain won't remember what you need it to remember. So recording is always important. Another thing is also to review your data. It's another thing to collect all of the data, but if you're not actually reviewing it, it's not going to do much good. If you are reviewing it, you're noticing where some of those fluctuations are in temperature, humidity. You know, I've been in situations where I can clearly see that for some reason the HVAC system is turning off at 2 o'clock every night and we can't figure out why. I can send that data, I, I can review it, I see that it's a problem, I can then give it to my facilities folks and say, here's a problem, I don't know what's going on. I've never been in a situation where the HVAC facility people have told me I've given them too much information, especially with regards to any sort of environment, environmental monitoring that I have done. They have always been very receptive to what I've been given them. So sharing that data is also important. So we're going to move on to the next subtopic that I have, which is stores, storage and exhibits. Uh, and one thing I wanted to point out with this picture is you can see that it's pretty dirty. There's some emulsion problems. This is an item that was um, that had been exposed to smoke and excess heat. And just kind of keep that in mind, the damage that's done. So I'm going to go over some of the problem areas within storage and exhibits. And, and I'm lumping the two together because a lot of times you're dealing with the same kinds of problems. You're dealing with lighting issues. So with lighting, you're dealing with the possibility of items fading over time. You can see in that photograph. Also, you're dealing with heat. Some of the lights actually give off more heat than others. And so that can cause problems over time. 
you're dealing with pollutants as well, two different kinds of pollutants. You've got the particulates and then you've got the gaseous pollutants. So with the particulates, those particulates can be very abrasive. They can cause abrasions, they can cause scratches, they might possibly cause losses. They also can be very attractive to pests and mold, so you always want to be careful. And then at times it can also cause staining. When you're talking about gaseous pollutants, so anything from sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and also ozone, and I'll give an example of ozone in a minute, uh, you're talking about any sort of staining, discoloration, uh, and also it can accelerate the deterioration. So that picture that I showed you beforehand, that had smoke damage. So um, not only was that um, gaseous in air, but it also caused a lot of problems. There was a lot of, a lot of materials within that smoke that caused the abrasion, it landed on that photograph and, and caused those abrasions and caused all of that discoloration to that item. Another problem area is also storage. So a lot of the storage, especially the um, original housing that comes with some of the items, is very acidic, or it can cause off-gassing, materials that can't breathe well. Um, and then also, I've run across issues where, um, especially with regards to foldering, typically, especially in archives, where um, I've got a legal size folder, but my item is much larger than a legal size than the legal size for folder, um, but someone has gone ahead and, and put that in there. It's not really doing any protection and it also can cause a lot of damage around that edge part. So what are some of the preventative ways that we can protect our materials from these different kinds of issues we find in storage and exhibits? One way is with our lighting requirements. So the levels should be kept as low as possible. Always turn off lights when not in use. For some areas, that's easier than others. If you're in an archives space environment and your storage area is separate from your, your processing space or your reading room space, it's much easier. You can turn off the lights during, in the stacks when you're not in there. Um, if you are processing or you do actually use that space um, throughout the day, when you go to lunch, you go to a meeting, you're leaving that room for any sort of period of time, go ahead and shut the lights off. It's going to help over time. It's also important to, to consider the UV component um, and to eliminate, eliminate that if possible. There are filters that you can put on both the windows and lights. This is a little bit more of an expensive treatment option, a preventative treatment option for materials um, and for your building. So there are other ways uh, that you can do low budget solution at the bottom that I have is invest in blinds or invest in curtains. If you are dealing, I've I've consulted where there was a problem that they couldn't put blinds up because they were in a historic building. Uh, they couldn't put any additional holes in the walls or anything like that. It's always time to be creative. Uh, is it possible to put up a tension rod if you pat the end so it doesn't do any more damage? Can you put a tension rod up there with even just a shower curtain or you can put a curtain on, on, on that? Um, it's time to be creative at that point when you've got some of those issues. So when looking at what should you be looking for in terms of light readings, if you have a lot of exhibits, you have a lot of material that are out throughout the year, it would probably be wise to invest in a light meter at that point so you can do some reading, so you can make sure the materials are in, are in the correct environment with regards to lighting. So the reading and inspection area, so your reading rooms um, and possibly some of your processing spaces, uh, depending on how, how much light you need, should be between 300 and 600 lux. For display, for those exhibit spaces, again, you do want people to be able to see them, so you want to give them some light. Uh, 50 to 150 lux lowers better, and also for limited times. Uh, I had a situation where we had an exhibit of a um, leaf of the Gutenberg Bible, and we actually took the light bulb out of that specific display case that we had. We had no individual control of each exhibit, um, exhibit cabinet, so we went ahead and took the light bulb off of that because that one was something that we didn't really want that kind of light exposed to it for a great period of time. For storage areas, 10 to 50 lux. 
And another thing that I also like to recommend is that when you do have an exhibit, it's always great to set up a plan for page turning, for replacing an item during a long exhibit. If you have an item up, you have an exhibit that's up for about six months to a year, Typically, at least moving the, turning the page at least once a month um, would be ideal more if you possibly can. Um, and if so, if you can't do that, if um, I know that sometimes you're, someone really wants to see a certain page and that's the page that's supposed to be on exhibit, consider whether or not you can do a facsimile of that page. And for those times when you know you have donors coming in, you've got important people, you've got the board of trustees coming in, um, or you have an opening exhibit, you can have the item out on display at that time and at those important times. Um, but occasionally replacing it with a facsimile um, might be the answer to, to your problem at that point. Looking at pollutants, uh, at particulates, um, some of the preventative preservation is filtering debris through central systems. It's always great to have those, those systems available um, to filter a lot of things. It also can help with mold as well. Create a regular schedule of replacing filters. That's probably one of the most difficult things to do because a lot of times you're, you're relying on your facilities or building management people to do that. So set up a regular schedule or a calendar and work with them on that. Or put a reminder on your calendar that you need to send them an update or, or a reminder that they need to change the filter. Plan for regular housekeeping, and that's dusting and vacuuming. Right now, uh, about two weeks ago, I just trained our shelving students and staff on how to uh, vacuum books on one of our floors that is the most used as the heaviest, uh, our lit our literature collection, so it's one of the heaviest used collections. And so they are dusting and vacuuming uh, just for general housekeeping. Protecting items inside enclosures and cabinets and boxes is also important. Uh, making sure that the, the boxes and the, and the enclosures are appropriate, which we'll talk in the next slide, is what, what would be deemed appropriate for preservation. Um, and then also keeping doors and windows closed. And that's pretty something simple that, that most institutions should be able to, to do. Gaseous. Uh, keep in mind that everyday facility items can, out, can actually off-gas. Um, and that includes building materials, furniture, uh, cleaning agents. Uh, a lot of times um, you'll see people who um, would Cabinets can be problematic because they can off, they actually off gas. That's why you see so many metal um, metal book uh, shelves within institutions. Um, photocopiers can actually create ozone, which can accelerate deterioration. Now, me saying this does not mean that you should never photocopy, do preservation photocopy. You shouldn't scan items. What it just means is keep that in mind. Um, I always try to tell people we want to scan things once and hopefully we don't have to scan them multiple times. So when you do scan something, make sure that it's the right size, um, that you've got it straightened up, that it's not crooked because you just don't want to expose the item to multiple scannings over time. And then good air exchange with clean replacement air will always help reduce pollution levels as well. And the last area within this subtopic is storage. So looking at, whenever I tell people to look for materials for their collection, I always tell them to look for something that's lignin free, something that's acid free. And if it needs to be a, a, a polyester, um, I tell them to look for something that's polypropylene or something that says mylar. And another thing that I always recommend to them is just because something says that it's archival, like you go to some of the craft stores nowadays, they'll say archival on it. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's acid free. I want to see the words acid free and lignin free on the item, on the packaging. And so there are a lot of vendors that will offer that that will very, very clearly state that it's lignin free and acid free. So those are key things to look for as well. Going into integrated pest management, which is one of my favorites. I am known as the bug lady around here, or the bug librarian. I always am. Um, so wanted to kind of go over what is actually considered a pest. There are a lot of different kinds of pests out there. I think a lot of times people think of 
the obvious, which would be the silverfish or the beetles, the cockroaches. But there are other kinds of pests that I also identify whenever I'm doing integrated pest management, which I will discuss in a minute. I look for spiders as well. Now, spiders don't necessarily eat collection materials, but what spiders' presence in my collection stacks tell me is that there's a food source for those spiders. Same thing with in Texas, we tend to get geckos a lot, and geckos don't really eat collections either. But what the geckos are telling me is that they are finding a food source somewhere within my collection. So those are things to also identify. Another kind of pests are the, the furrier kind, so you've got the mice rats, and sometimes people don't consider things like squirrels, raccoons, or possums, but those can cause a lot of problems as well. When I was a student, uh, we were doing a, a museum studies course, and we went to a house museum. There was a lovely display cabinet, built-in display cabinet in the corner, and we asked about the materials inside that cabinet. They said none of them were original. Uh, all of the original items had been broken because a squirrel from the attic had gotten inside that cabinet and freaked out because it couldn't get out and completely damaged and broke all of the dishes that were in that cabinet. Something that you don't really expect. Uh, and that story has stuck with me for a long time. I also was doing an assessment once in a collection in rural New Hampshire and there was a barn um, where someone had collected and stashed all of their their collections and it was became a nest for porcupines and so there was porcupine feces and porcupine porcupine quills all over these these collections it was uh, not something that we decided to take um, because it was it was quite prevalent but you can get some some interesting pests out there so I just wanted to go over a couple of these pests in detail so that you can understand exactly what it is that they're attracted to for these items. So looking at silverfish, which are one of the more prevalent items that we, uh, prevalent pests that we see, the silverfish eat material that are high in protein and sugar and starch. So what that means is that they're very attracted to the starch within our book bindings, the sizing and paper, and also the glue or paste that are used. And what they typically do is they bite very small holes in pretty much anything that you've got in your collection. So they like fabric, they like cotton, they like linen, silk. Um, they can't really digest it very well, but they still eat it. Another example is cockroach, which again is very prevalent in collections and buildings in general. They eat pretty much anything. Uh, so they will eat the typical kinds of things that you find in the kitchen, but also they like things that are very starchy. And so they will eat anything from leather to wallpaper paste, paste in general, book bindings and sizing. And you can see in this image here that I have on the bottom, that bottom picture with all of that white, that it actually should be that navy black cover. Um, a cockroach has gone through and eaten the top of that because they were so interested in it. And you can see what it left over. And that's kind of the telltale sign of when you know that you've got a collection, is you see the leftover bits of what they didn't eat. That's one way that I can usually tell that we've got a problem. Another way of identifying that you've got pests is to, sometimes when I get collections, I don't necessarily see an active infestation. What I see is the result of an infestation, whether or not it's active or not. Um, typically that means that there is a lot of what we politely call frass, which is essentially pest feces. And that's what I have both on these pictures right here. The item on the left was a um, 16th century um, a 16th century special collections for a book that was given to us uh, and it had all of this feces over it which um, caused some problems. There were also a lot of um, dead insects inside but clearly this the amount of feces that was on here let me know what was going on that this had been that there had been infestation for a while. The item on the right again it looks like mud but it's actually not. All of that is insect frass. That was a 
Um, that was from a collection in the university archives. Most of the damage that we actually see within the libraries and archives, because we are so careful about what we bring into the building, most of it happens before it even gets to us. So what we need to do is make sure that we're not introducing anything new into our collections um, and making sure that uh, we aren't spreading any sort of problem. So what do pests really do besides being really gross sometimes? Uh, one thing is that they can cause irreversible damage. When a insect has eaten away that book cloth, that book cloth is gone. I can't replace that book cloth. I'm going to have to completely rebind it. That older manuscript that you saw that was bound, I can't fix that. All of that, all that they ate is gone. Uh, it would have to be completely rebound. And so we've lost some of that original item. There are different ways of treating infestations. There is fumigation of collections, which depending on the person or the institution, some are for it, some aren't. When you're dealing with fumigation, a lot of times you're talking about chemicals. So you always have to take that in consideration, is what are the chemicals going to do for the collection? What are the chemicals going to do with the people who are going to be using the collection or the people who are working with the collection inside the library? There's oxygen deprivation or CO2 treatment. There's also freezing and vacuuming. Typically don't vacuum unless I know the, the, that the issue is an old issue. I don't really vacuum up live insects. It's mainly something that I know has been dormant for quite some time. With all of these issues, you're looking at a lot of costs, a lot of time, staff, outside vendors, equipment. It can be very costly, very time consuming. One of my case studies I have for this is, is bed bugs. Um, a lot of us probably dealt with bed bugs in the past. Um, had a situation uh, before I left SIU where um, we have uh, most of our influx of materials coming through our general collections comes at the end of the semester, and that's typical for a lot of academic librarians and libraries. And so we also had a high student turnover because students were leaving and they were hiring new students. I had a created, once the, when I figured out that the bed bugs were a major issue years ago, I had created a fact sheet, an identification sheet for circulation and went through it with them. And they used it as part of their training for all of their students. Well, that training had kind of slipped aside because most of the students had been only working for about a week. And so they did not notice when something came in that had bed bugs in it. And it wasn't noticed for about a week and a half. Uh, it had sat down in our circulation for about a week and then it moved up to preservation where it was my preservation, my conservation lab supervisor who actually identified it as a problem. Because it had been out there for a week and a half, we had to quarantine everything. We had to freeze everything. Uh, we had to call in uh, a, um, a exterminator to take a look at the areas, to spray areas. The books had been moved from station to station to station, so we had about four to five staff deaths that could have been affected, uh, infected, infested. And so it was just very time consuming. Um, we had to freeze all of the items. It took over a month to get everything cycled through because we did it twice just to make sure that everything was dead. Um, but it took us a very long time to get all of that done. And that meant that the items weren't available for our patrons, which is always one of our, our major concerns, is making sure that we can get things available. So it, it cost a lot of time. Um, and it was not a pleasant time for anyone and caused some panic, of course. Um, but if you can prevent that, if you can create that education, that's all the better. And I have included that in our integrated, integrated, I missed the D there, pest management IPM program. Similar to that whole environmental monitoring program that I stated, this is another one. This is a intentional program. It's not a let's set the sticky traps out and ignore them. It's actual looking at what, what's being collected and identifying that. It's providing the education. So if you're working in a library that has a circulating collection, is to educate folks on what to look for when, when items are coming in. Bed bugs are still pretty prevalent, and, and I think they're going to be so for, for a while. Also, looking at the assess, assess the building and the facility, identify, do you have any program problem areas? Do you have um, areas where the ceiling under the door is not, you can see daylight, it's not sealed correctly? Um, trying to fix those areas. 
Also is assessing some of the new collections coming into the building. This is a little easier, especially for some of the archive materials, is to quarantine the items, to look through it before putting it into the rest of the collections. I know one of the biggest problems with that is space. A lot of times you just don't have the space to quarantine things. Try to figure out a way of quarantining them or putting them aside, going through them very quickly to see. You can put them aside and put traps around there because most of the times at night especially the, the insects will come out and will stick to the traps if you've got them around a collection. Um, one of the worst things that I've ever caught in a trap was a vole and a vole is a uh, basically like a shrew type rodent. Um, that was the weirdest thing I think I've ever caught on a sticky trap. But you set and monitor those traps. Typically, if you can, once a week, uh, at least once a month, you want to go through and you want to record what it is that you're finding in those traps and set a new trap down. You don't want to put an old trap back up, back there because that will screw what you're that will skew what your what your kind of data you're collecting. You want to make sure that you know what's happening each month and what new is appearing. General housekeeping is always important as well. And then monitoring food and drink. I know a lot of libraries are allowing much more lenient and liberal food drink policies than some of us would prefer. Um, but it's monitoring that and making sure that you're not having any problems. Um, when you're in an archives uh, or special collections, you know, creating guidelines as to where people should eat, where it's appropriate for food and drink, that can also help. And the last topic that I'm going to cover is mold. It's everyone's favorite. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work when you run into it. So what is mold? Mold is a fungi. There are about 10,000 species of fungi, and that includes mold, mushrooms, mildew, all of that is considered a fungi. So mold is just a series of that. Mold is made up of a variety of different spores, and they're all airborne. And then it can also vary in color, and want to keep that in mind whenever you're looking at a collection. Don't just assume it's going to be black. We always hear about the black mold, but mold can come into a variety of different colors. The image that you see on the right there, there are a couple different colors there. That just happened a couple weeks ago when we had a leak, um, and they didn't get dried out appropriately. Another thing that you might hear in conversation when, when talking about mold is the idea of active mold versus inactive mold. And what active mold, when someone tells you that the mold is still active, what that means is that it's still growing. That the, and that typically tells me that my environment is not correct because it's finding moisture somewhere for it to continue to grow. So um, that means the temperature and the, and the relative humidity is not stable. For an inactive mold, that means that the environment is a little bit more stable. And usually when it's inactive, that's when we start treating items. That's when you'll see the vacuuming um, and, and the treatment such as that is when it's inactive. When I have something that's active, I actually try to find the appropriate environment so that it can start deactivating to the point where I can then start treating it. What causes mold? This is, uh, this is another lesson learned that I have, uh, is the different types of materials absolute, absolute, uh, absorb the different amounts of water. So when different materials are exposed to the same environment, some are going to develop mold and others do not. I was working on a project where we discovered that we had mold in our collection, and I was very confused as to why in my 200 plus run volume run of the American Library or American Medical Association journal, why certain ones had mold and certain ones didn't. And it was clear to see that there was a certain kind of cloth material or buckram that one attracted mold easier than the other, which meant that those that had more mold actually absorbed the moisture a little bit quicker and more so than the other materials. And I find that fascinating. But that's when you see when you have rooms where you've got some things that have mold and some things that don't. It's just some things are going to absorb the moisture a little bit differently. Lower temperature and higher humidity increases the chance of mold growth. So when you're doing your environmental environment monitoring, remember when I said recording that data and reviewing it is important. When you start seeing some of that 
the difference when you see the temperature going lower and you see the humidity going higher that should raise a bit of a red flag that you should go ahead and try to take care of the situation before it gets too bad because mold can grow and the mold growth can actually start to occur within 48 to 72 hours so you really want to be careful and keep an eye on what's going on so what does mold actually do? What kind of damage does it do? So mold will eat paper and other materials that you typically find within the libraries and archives. It's particularly attracted to the cellulose and the starch adhesive and also the sizing. And what mold actually does is it will excrete a digestive enzyme and that's what allows them to eat these types of materials. And those enzymes are part of the problem. Those enzymes are what really alters and weakens and then also ultimately stains the materials. Another thing to consider is the more personnel issues that you can have with mold. Um, there's some people who are just more susceptible to the issues with regards to mold than others. So some people have higher issues with allergies. They might have asthma that the mold will trigger the asthma attack, uh, respiratory problems in general. And then people who also have weak immune systems can have problems with mold. And it can also cause a lot of skin and eye irritations. As strange as it is, I get a very strange headache. It's a certain headache that I only get when I'm dealing with mold. It's in the center of my forehead, and it's the only, only time I ever get this. So I have been in people's offices talking to them, meeting with them, and all of a sudden I get this headache, and I stop the conversation and say, what do you have in your office? I have my mold headache. And it's not. It's not the nicest thing to have, um, but it, it's become part of my identifier, and it's a problem that I have and that I try to deal with by, by wearing appropriate equipment. So we have found mold. What do we do? You're going to check the environment first. You're going to look at the temperature and the percent RH, your relative humidity. You're going to see whether or not you've, you have problems with that. Is there moisture coming through somewhere? Is there a problem with the HVAC system? These are all things that you should be running through your head. Once you do find out what the problem is, or even previous, if you still don't know what your problem is, you do need to modify the environment. So if you can, you need to try to stabilize that temperature and relative humidity. It's always recommended that you really try to go below 70 degrees Fahrenheit and it go 55% or lower. We talked about those standards beforehand, and that would be ideal. But when you're dealing with a situation where um, you've got the possibility of mold growth, you really want to adjust it as soon as possible. And these are, these are the basic standards to look at when trying to change that environment. If you need to, you need to remove the water and moisture. That's if you have a water disaster and you've got standing water or you've got water in the area. Go ahead and remove that if possible. And increase the air circulation and draw up moisture from the air. So you can do that by using fans or dehumidifiers. And as I mentioned before with my headaches, nowadays, because I know I get those, I'm very careful about what I wear and how I interact with things that I think have mold. It's always important to consider your personal protective equipment, or PPE, what we call, and the very basics is getting gloves, which are for preferably non-latex gloves because a lot of people do have that latex allergy. A uh, protective mask, preferably an N95 or an N100. I have an N95 in my office that I carry around with me when I know that I'm dealing with those kinds of issues. And then also goggles. Uh, I have contacts and so I do want to make sure that I'm not getting anything underneath my contacts. There are additional types of personal protective equipment to get as well if you're concerned. And that includes anything from Tyvek aprons or you can get Tyvek lab coats um, and you can get shower caps for your hair if you're really that concerned. But these three things are really the basics um, that's always good to have on, on hand when you're dealing with these issues. So preventative measures, keeping environmental safe, as keep the the environment stable. That's the basic. And creating that environmental monitoring plan that we discussed before. So identifying those materials in the collection, determine what your best standards for your own institution's relative humidity and temperature. Using those data loggers or those hygrothermographs to kind of record that data and record save the data and again report any issues that you see immediately. Don't let it go. You never know what's going to happen. And it's usually, if you see something very s suspicious, there's usually something going on. And going ahead and report that so it can be taken care of right away. Another preventative measure is to assess new materials coming through. If you've got things coming in from a questionable location 
quarantine the items. Dealing with in Texas here, we've got a lot of materials that come from Houston and attics and all sorts of places. So we typically quarantine our items so that we know what's coming in, both for pests and also for mold. And separate anything suspicious. If you think that you've got something with mold, go ahead and bag it up. I tell my circulation department that if it looks weird, smells weird, you don't want to touch it, put it in a bag, and I will deal with it. Uh, I'd rather have them be more cautious and then have something slip through. So I have a couple resources. That's kind of the, the majority of my presentation that I have here. But I do have some resources that um, I use on a pretty regular basis and I also refer to while putting this together. Um, there are really great leaflets at the Northeast Document Conservation Center. There are several different places you can get a lot of information regarding pests. Um, Pass It On Preservation Week is also a great resource um, where you can ask Danya, who Danya is a, a preservation consultant conservator who can ask, answer your questions for some of these if you have specific items. Uh, specific questions regarding preservation of your collection, and then also Cornell Library Preservation and Conservation. So, any questions? Hi, Julie. That was great. He packed a lot in. <laughs> hopefully, I'm hopefully not too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Um, we do have one question from Mary. And her question is, for collections, heavy in leather and vellum materials, would you suggest a slightly higher level of RH to keep them supple? And do you have any special temperature or RH concerns for artwork? Hmm. That is an interesting question. And I am actually going to call upon, I have got some colleagues who are listening. Um, I have not had to necessarily deal too much with some of the artwork issues um, and, and the concerns regarding artwork. Um, I think that for the most part, when I've dealt with library with leather and vellum materials, it, it's been lumped in in terms of storage with the rest of the book and paper materials. And I haven't seen too many issues regarding that, but um, I do. I will call on my colleagues if they have anything that they want to add um, on this. But I'm afraid that it's not. Um, it's it's not uh, something that I deal with on a daily basis. I'm afraid. Yeah, I think it might help if Mary, if you could be more specific about the artwork perhaps. Do you mean art on paper, in which case it would be a lot of the same concerns um, or something different, more unusual? Um, so although one of our backup, our helpers today is just saying, um, to watch out for light, of course, is a big problem when you're talking about artwork and things being framed. So on exhibit for more often than trying to filter out that light if it's a framed piece of art. So we'll circle back to that if you have any more specifics, I guess, Mary, about what kind of artwork. There is some other questions here. Um, Cheryl asks, <laughs> we get birds in the library. <laughs> And some bird poop. What else should we look for? <laughs> you know, we actually have a problem in Texas. We have a problem with bats. And um, so we get bats and bat guano. Um, so we've had that problem. Um, and I've also been in a couple institutions where um, at UT Austin, I know that they've had problems with pigeons and pigeons nesting on windows. So they created, a, they put a netting over the window so that the pigeons can nest because there are five to six different beetles that actually live within a pigeon's nest. And those were coming inside the library. Um, I think that I would, I would question where those birds are actually living. They're living somewhere, probably in the ceiling or within the stacks. And I would be concerned about um, what they're making their nest out of. Um, I think with birds, looking for feathers is always an issue. Um, but I, I would figure out exactly how the birds are getting in and if there's a way of preventing them from coming in, um, if there's an easy way of doing that. Um, that that would be very problematic. Okay. Um, 
Let's see, David asks, first he says nice presentation, but then David has um, a question about specifications or lighting requirements and wonders if there's a reference book related to that that you could recommend off the top of your head. There are um, lighting for uh, museum environments. Um, I don't have that title off the top of my head, um, but the, um, the preservation leaflets from the Northeast Document Conservation Center, or NEDCC, those are very helpful. Um, I believe that's where I got my information, as well as um, the National Park Service has conservagrams, which are also very helpful. They also have a, a museum handbook that has a lot of information, um, and they pertain to lighting as well and storage. And so those are great resources to take a look at. Yeah, and that's maybe something we can follow up with later. It's hard to pull those out of a hat. Um, let's see. And continuing on David's questions, uh, let's see, he's asking about how you plan a budget, I am, I'm guessing, for um, preservation services or preservation program. Planning a budget is really difficult. Uh, I'm actually in the process of doing that right now because I am new to Texas A&M, and this is a, preservation is a brand new uh, not a brand new concept, but it's a brand new unit, and so they didn't know really what to give me budget-wise, so I'm kind of starting off. I think you need to figure out what kinds of information you need. So let's go to environmental monitoring. You've got to decide how much information do you need. Do you need to be able to create those graphs and present those graphs to people? If so, you're probably going to want to budget some of those more expensive monitors. If just getting a data logger that's about $15, $15 from your local hardware store that just gives you temperature and relative humidity, if that's enough information for you, then you can budget in about $15 per item. Um, it, the Integrated pest management is also pretty simple. Those sticky traps, um, you can buy those in bulk, and that's not too expensive. Um, but you really have to take a look at, I, what I would suggest is you actually do an assessment of your entire facility first, and then identify where your problem areas are and what it is that you want to do. If you want to do environmental monitoring for your entire building, that's great. If you only want to monitor your storage collections and your processing space, then that's great. If you need to do individual offices, that adds a little bit to the cost. Same thing with the, with the integrated pest management. If you know that you've got problematic areas, I'd start with those areas first. And if you have the funds, go ahead and do the entire area. But I think that that primary that first assessment and part of that planning, if you listened into Karen's presentation yesterday, she talked about assessments and planning. Um, that's part of that to kind of give you an idea of how to budget um, for, for the future. Um, there's also a question, let's see, someone at a large public library where they get gifts that are sorted by um, Friends of the Library volunteers, and she's huh. wondering if you have, this is from Dee or Dia, um, if you have any suggestions for how to avoid cross-contamination between the donations and the collection. Yes, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> I've had that kind of kind of problem before um, where we've had donations come in. Um, I think it would probably, you could probably try two different ways. Uh, you could try um, doing a, you know, it's always great to have an excuse to do preservation education. So it might be that you could actually do a presentation, whether it's brief or not, to the friends so that you can, you can talk about um, the various issues that happen, the mold, um, insects coming in. It's a great opportunity for education, and you can teach them and see um, whether or not they can pick up on that, and if they can start doing some of that on their own and look for some of that as they're searching through. Um, the other thing, unfortunately, would probably mean doing a completely different workflow. Work 
workflow um, and just kind of doing a spot check maybe of the books that they select um, that go into the collections or are near the collections. Um, but I think, as I mentioned, I'm always a big fan of any opportunity I have to provide preservation education and kind of jump on it. And I think that this would be a great opportunity for you uh, to work with the friends and provide some education. Okay, there's another question from Susan who writes, our archives are located in a small room that is very warm and dry, around 78 degrees, with very low humidity. Is this detrimental to our collection? And the temperature is a little higher than it really should be. Um, I, I don't know what your low humidity necessarily means, but um, that heat's going to cause some problems over time. Um, I think that it would probably be, be wise to see whether or not um, if you have facilities or building maintenance come in and see whether or not you can you can lower that temperature a little bit. Um, as I mentioned with my HVAC system that didn't quite meet the requirements I needed um, at SIU, what we did was I set a standard that it could meet. It was not ideal at all, but it still fit within those ranges that you saw. It was, a little, it was on the higher end of the range of those standards that I gave you from, from NISO and from NARA. Um, it was around 72. That's still getting high, but that's that was the max that I allowed my temperature to go. 788 is getting a little warm there, and I think that I would recommend that you see whether or not you could um, you'd actually uh, lower that a bit. Okay. And just to get back, um, one of our um, previous instructors uh, mentioned that I want to make sure is that birds birds are actually um, can be very um, problematic. Um, they're not healthy. Um, they can cause some health problems. Um, and so you do want, really want to make sure that you get those birds checked the birds coming into collections and the buildings checked out because um, that could be potential problems for your staff and also for your patrons. So you probably really want to try to take care of that um, and figure out how they're getting in and seeing if you can get them removed from the building. Oh, that's a good point. Does anyone else have any questions? We have time for one last one. I don't see any more. I was just going to mention um, one resource that I found helpful in terms of doing budgets is the Preservation Manager's Guide to Cost Analysis, which is an ALA publication. Yes, that is wanna... very, very good. Yeah, that can be real helpful in doing sort of the nuts and bolts. <laughs> it's a good way, it's a, it's a good publication to use so you can create a plan to then take to your administrators because that's that's pretty much what you have to do is um, create that plan. It will do a cost analysis for what you need. It tells you some additional things that you don't always take in consideration. Um, and it gives you a good basis to then create a plan for your administration. OK. Um, so that someone asked us to repeat that. It's the Preservation Manager's Guide to Cost Analysis. So I think with that, um, Unless you want to have, do you have any other things you want to say, Julie, before we wrap up? Nope, nope. I just want to thank you, Stephanie, for, okay. for introducing me and, and being our moderator. Yep, you're welcome. And thanks for a great presentation. Like I said, I think you really packed a whole lot in with environment and storage and integrated pest management and mold all in one in 45 minutes. That's, I am impressed. <laughs> so thank you. Um, before we end today, I'd just like to remind you that there's still time to sign up for the last session of this virtual pre-conference. Tomorrow's presentation is on Preserving Digital Collections with Peter Verhein. I want to also thank all our attendees. We hope you found today's presentation useful. You'll soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELEX Program Committee plan new virtual pre-conferences and webinars. 
There are also three in-person Alexa Pre conferences being held at the ALA Annual Conference in Las Vegas, if any of you are planning to attend. And those are Fundamentals of Collection Assessment, which is an introduction to all the fundamental aspects of collection assessment in libraries. And that's going to be taught by Rita Sinha and Corey Tucker. There's also one on the 27th on statistics and reports, data-driven decision-making, taught by Michael Levine Clark and Beth Bernhardt. And lastly, streaming media on the morning of June 27th, which will be taught by Deg Farrelly from Arizona State, Kirk Blankenship, and Jessica Hammond. Details and registration for these Alex pre-conferences and for all Alex events at the annual conference can be found at the Alex ALA annual webpage. Suggestions for future virtual pre-conferences and webinars are welcome at any time. Please visit, visit the Alex website, click on the Members How-To tab, and then click on Plan an Event, or contact Rita Sinha or Becky Ryder, whose emails you see here. I would also like to thank Iping Jen Gaffney for providing technical support for today's webinar. And thank you again for joining us today. We hope you will participate in other Alex webinars and continuing education offerings in the future. Thanks very much. Have a good rest of the day.